Friends, peace it. So I was just following, following in this slightly different version of the Bible when Liz read, Be healed from your disease. This version says, Be freed from your suffering. And so we continue today with the third of the series of looking at the liturgy. And the Greek word, word, of course, means word of the people, and it is a whole communal experience. And today we are looking at listening to the word, conversion by the word. A brief mention of the gradual hymn, then talking a little bit about the sermon and then prayers. And so I pray, dear God, thank you for your presence. For you yourself speak in your word. Amen. So we've had the gathering, we've affirmed our faith, we have sung praise and worship, and now we proclaim the scriptures. And it follows a pattern of the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Bible, a psalm, one of the letters or epistles, and then the gospel. And of course, in Easter time, we read Acts instead of the Old Testament. And we follow a three-year cycle of what's called the Revised Common Lectionary. It is something that the mainstream churches throughout the world follow. So on this day, we are all following the readings of Samuel, Corinthians, and Mark. And the word that we read has an immediacy and a, re and a relevance for us because Jesus is truly present in the scripture as the word. But we also understand that the Bible is not absolute. We need to be careful about following the Bible to its very letter for that means we can worship a book rather than worshiping God. We need to inspire and understand that scripture is inspired by God. It is written and edited by many men, but it is inspired by God. And we need to look at it always through the lens of God's love. And as with the disciples, we need to listen to the ears of our hearts. We need to listen, for often we speak to God a lot more than we listen <coughs> to God. And when we look at scripture as inspired, we need to look at the context of what it was then, with all its inherent patriarchy, the political situation of the time. <clears throat> we need to look at the context of whoever wrote or edited the scripture. And then we need to look at the context of our own lives so we can bring it all together. And that again speaks to the immediacy, the relevance of the word and the word is powerful we're told in gospel of john that the word created the universe and we know in our lives that our words can uplift someone our words can touch and cause pain <coughs> and sometimes our actions speak so loudly that you cannot hear what we are saying and we know the scripture is challenging. We know the scripture is sometimes opaque. We do sometimes wonder about the relevance of scripture. And a colleague of Pulitzer, of the Pulitzer Book Prize, said that scripture is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And when Jesus spoke about scripture, He brought it in around reconciliation. Reconciliation of humanity to God. Reconciliation of humanity to one another. And indeed the words of scripture describe God's actions towards us. And so scripture offers ongoing conversion. Scripture offers a lifelong journey of being shaped by God. 
Scripture offers a lifelong journey of developing a relationship with God and with self. And indeed, as we go through the liturgy of communion, make the liturgy and Scripture and all our praise and worship your own. And allow yourself to be present in God. And then we have the gradual hymn as we move from the New Testament reading to the Gospel. <clears throat> gradual means graduate, to change. And it is a song of glory and praise. And the focus of the gradual is on that praise. Unlike the other hymns that we sing, in Troy there's activity, we are processing up to the altar. The offertory, there is a trinity as we offer what God has given us to the church. The communion hymn is while we're receiving communion, and the exploit, of course, is while we exit the church. The gradual is praise and glory. That is the focus. And then we come to the sermon. And I hope the sermon is never seen as glory to whoever is preaching. And part of the reason we row as we do is to be representative of Christ. And when we prepare our sermons, when we prepare, if we are looking at the readings, we're expected to do it in a prayerful way. We're expected to do it when the Spirit speaks through us. When Bishop Brian retired, he returned to St. Martin's Church, where he had previously been rector. And I had just joined that church as part of my journey. And I remember him saying, or he often introduced a sermon, may the written word, through the spoken word, become the living word. The Presbyterian invocation is, may it not be my words, but the words of Christ which are the words of God. And of course we often begin with Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth, may the meditation of my heart be ever pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And again referring to Bishop Brian, he said as the responsibility of a preacher is to represent God. And he continues and says, if people do not see the Spirit in you, if they do not see God in you, if they do not hear God in your words, then what you are saying is of no importance. But if they do see God in you, Again, what you say is of no importance because the message is heard by the ears of our hearts. And it follows synagogue practice as we so often hear the account of Jesus taking the scriptures and his passing on them. And in the synagogues and in many churches, and we do it in some of the smaller communities like Wednesday Worship, it's an opportunity for discussion. It's an opportunity to listen to what God has maybe put in your heart. And so it became in the early church that preaching was initially only the privilege of the bishop. And there are a lot of words that are spoken. There are a lot of words that are read. We have three readings in the psalm, and then we have 10, 12, 15 minutes of me talking to you. So many words. And yes, we hope that there is teaching in what we do. But also, just understand that if you only pick up one sentence, you only pick up one word. You only pick up one theme through the word and the spoken word. That is.
is he not? That is the spirit speaking to the ear of your heart. Woman, your faith has cured you. The Catholic Church has sermons centralized around the message from the Pope. So in the Catholic Church, the sermons throughout the world are very much identical. In the Protestant churches, Anglican Church, we are given the freedom to interpret the word as we, as we see it. And in the Dark Ages, the word from the pulpit was often ex politically expedient. And in some churches, it sometimes still is. In the Dark Ages, it was often the only place of education or of teaching and training. And so I would hope that whatever the word is given in the preaching, in the teaching, is always uplifting of God and God's kingdom. And then we come to prayer. We've typically followed form A or B, or we're entitled to follow whatever prayers the lay minister has, has developed. And prayer is not always about the spoken word. <coughs> prayer can also be in silence. Prayer can be in simply being present in God. And the prayers come in various forms. The one obvious one is praise and worship, music, ceremony, which is an outward looking to God, raising our voices to God. And then we have adoration, which is more an inward focus. Adoration is resting in the presence of God contemplating all of creation, very much more mystical. We have prayers of confession. A general confession would be sorrow for our past transgressions. Personal confession would be more around self-examination. And sacramental confession is very much the Catholic concept. But we in our prayer book have a right of confession. And you're entitled to come to your priest or minister for confession. And what I often say around penitence and confession, it's not always speaking about what you have done or what you have not done. It is also an opportunity to lift up to God what is in your heart, the darkness in your heart, the places where you know you are going to fail and you need grace. And then if we'll have the prayers now, prayers of intercession, prayers that are around the church, prayers around the world, all nations of the world for this nation, prayers for the community, which are often for those in sickness or in need. But also prayers celebrating, for example, birthdays and anniversaries. And then there are prayers for those who have passed, our loved ones who we record in the year's mind, but also recognizing the apostles and saints who have gone before us. And then finally we have prayers of thanksgiving, of absolute gratitude, whether it be personal or corporate. And so we see the power of Scripture, the power of words. And I'm going to end with a comment again from Bishop Brian. Jesus preached about love. Paul took that message and preached about love. So enter into true love and you will find the heart of God. Jesus preached about love. 
Paul preached about love. Enter into true love and you will find the heart of